having me and thank you Florian for inviting me. Um, so as Florian mentioned, I'm a biomedical and machine learning engineer. Um, I kind of bridged the, the, the academic space into entrepreneurship a couple of years ago, so now we're on a startup. Um, but the, the point of my talk will be really to uh, talk to you about a giant problem uh, that I've kind of spent the last five years trying to solve from very different angles. Um, so back in 2014, I was working at the World Health Organization, so in public health. Uh, and it was the first time I stumbled across the massive challenge that is childhood pneumonia. Um, at the time, I didn't realize it's the number one killer of children under five. And I found that absolutely shocking that in the 21st century, a perfectly treatable disease takes the lives of one million children. And my job at the time consisted of really looking at the innovation space, at the you know, Googles and Facebooks and so on of the world, pharma companies um, and academic labs, and trying to map out wh where is likely innovation going to come from to address this very burning issue. Um, so I compiled my report for the WHO and really reached the conclusion that um, we're, we're missing a giant opportunity to deliver healthcare for billions of people. Um, so my journey then began um, in terms of uh, bridging machine learning, AI, and community care. Um, so what I mean by community care is figuring out how do we deliver healthcare, diagnosis in particular, in community settings. So outside the clinic, in people's homes, in um, communities, in nursing homes, how do we push the boundaries of healthcare beyond this um, um, kind of facility-centered model that we have around the world? Um, so, taking a step back, after the Second World War, uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, decided to define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, which sounds perfectly aspirational and at the same time terribly negligent of the majority of population. So if, if, if you are an elderly person with multiple chronic conditions, if you're a person with disability, if you're a child working in a poor country, by that definition you have absolutely no chance of attaining health in your life. Um, so nowadays people are starting to think a bit more broadly and accept that really we should be looking at how do we harness the innovation we have, the policy that we can write and um, dictate to really help people attain health as per their own circumstances, as per their pre-existing conditions, the circumstances within the, which they live, um, and so on. Um, so really this is the context of um, what's kind of the greatest aspiration in healthcare, universal healthcare coverage. How can we move to a space where healthcare is a human right and everyone, regardless of geography, price tag, background, is able to receive healthcare where they live? Um, so this in particular was a commitment that governments around the world um, signed up to in 2018 um, in Astana in Kazakhstan to really drive healthcare, um, or rather access, universal, universal access to healthcare um, around the globe. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because the one tool that was universally highlighted was technology. It's only through technology that we have the opportunity to reach that aspiration. Why am I saying this? Um, so if you look at any healthcare system around the world, you have this situation. We have um, overwhelming demand. So worldwide, 8 million people die of perfectly uh, avoidable um, sorry, you have 8 million perfectly avoidable deaths, you have 5 million children under 5 um, dying every year, 24% growth in the number of chronic conditions, i.e. conditions that people continue to live with throughout their life. And if you take um, this healthcare, healthcare system, for example, in just a decade, we've doubled the number of appointments that a GP has to provide per person. So all that's telling us is, the tools we have at hand can definitely not meet the demand that we're facing today. What we have on the supply side is a massive gap of doctors. So worldwide, we're missing 7 million doctors. So even if we started training 10 times as, much, as many as we're training today, we're still not going to meet the demand. And at the end of the day, if we wanted to use the tools we have at hand 
at the moment, it would cost us another 400 billion annually to deliver universal healthcare service. And this will only get worse um, as our populations grow and age at the same time. Uh, I am a technology geek, so I went into biomedical engineering in love with hardware, all the opportunities the medical devices bring. So whenever I see another medical wearable, I definitely get very, very excited um, about the promise that that holds. Um, and, and there is a lot of advancement on that front. Um, so if you look at video consultations, chatbots, wearable devices, that's definitely uh, kind of bringing the boundaries of healthcare beyond what we, what we had over the last decade. But even if you manage to manufacture the best wearable in the world and put it into the hands of every single person around the world, you're still stuck with the same challenge, which is what do you do with all that data? You can use very simple digital thresholds, which is how our system operates at the moment. Is your heart rate too high, too low? Is your blood pressure going ab above certain thresholds? To try and kind of filter all that information that's going to start hitting doctors. <coughs> but all of that is, sure, geographically scalable, but terribly, terribly unspecific. So if you're an elderly person that lives with three conditions, very complex conditions, these thresholds are not going to get us anywhere. Or you could try and somehow magically manufacture doctors. I already told you we're missing 7 million, so that's not going to get us anywhere. But that's the best we have at the moment in terms of precision medicine, I, a complex evaluation of all the health parameters that quantify one's health to reach decisions. Uh, which brings me to my entrepreneurial journey. So I set up Febris with this mission of bridging this this gap and powering doctor quality detection of complex conditions at scale. And in particular, starting with respiratory conditions. So going back to the, the start of my story, respiratory conditions because of this one massive problem, pneumonia, that currently kills one million children, but also creates massive problems for our elderly people. So if you look at uh, countries like India, Annually, you have 160,000 children that die of the disease, and this costs the healthcare system one billion pounds. And at the other age um, and income extreme, you have in the UK, um, the number one driver of avoidable hospitalization is the exact same disease, costing the NHS one, 1.7 billion pounds. There is also a geographic inequality in, in the way that disease burden is distributed. Uh, particularly for children, 99% of mortality is concentrated in low resource settings. So how are we tackling this issue? Um, we are trying to bridge the gap between what's currently a facility-based healthcare system and communities by bringing point of care devices, so digital stethoscopes, post oximeters, medical wearables, all of this hardware that's becoming more and more prolific and can be put into the hands of very minimally trained users. We're combining that with a very intuitive mobile application so that you can have carers, community healthcare workers, even family members take measurements uh, whenever necessary to capture all that information that currently is only captured by, let's say, a GP in this country or a highly trained doctor in, the, in another setting. Then the role of our AI and where AI, AI pay, plays an important role is in the interpretation of those measurements. So these wonderful devices do exist on the market at the moment, the, but the majority of them are created for doctors. So if you look at any digital stethoscope, it's meant for a very highly trained doctor to use it in a hospital and then interpret the signal that it generates based on decades of training that they've received in their clinical practice. We're automating this with machine learning. And then the final piece of, um, that completes the puzzle is really figuring out how do we share this information in an actionable way with the health system so that we can con continue delivering um, healthcare in a, in a very evidence-based way. Um, so to, just to give you a bit more visualization of what that looks like, if you haven't seen a digital stethoscope, that's the device at the bottom. 
Uh, the pulse oximeter, the one on top, is the device that goes on your finger, measures your heart rate, oxygen saturation, and if you've ever been to a hospital, you've definitely had one of those put on your finger. Um, in terms of our mobile application, um, it's basically designed in a way where the user needs to know where to place the device and just follow that simple procedure without needing to interpret anything. Um, and at the end of the examination, they're given an actionable insight. So depending on the setting, it could be take the patient to a hospital um, or a very um, kind of precise identification of a condition, let's say an asthma exacerbation, which requires an a &E, um, trip. And let me just give you um, kind of a very practical example. So sticking with childhood pneumonia um, is kind of the first problem that we started working on. Um, our first trial was in 2017 in India with 1,300 children. And really the goal there was how do we empower an existing workforce um, to deliver precision medicine. Um, so in the case of India, there is one million healthcare workers that currently service the population. These are people that have high school education um, and currently um, conduct very observational tasks. So they'll go around the communities and try and spot different markers of disease observationally in order to identify the kids that need to go to hospital. What we did was provide them with a mobile application and our sensors so that within 10 minutes they can collect the data required to make a more evidence-based evaluation. Um, and based on the success of that program, uh, we received international funding to scale to 10,000 children. So that's the program we're currently running in India with partners. Um, just to give you, because you're all people that love data, just to give you a bit of a flavor of um, performance, diagnostic performance. Um, so we demonstrated that we can be 97% accurate when it comes to triage, namely identifying kids that have respiratory issues and 85% accurate when it comes to diagnosing pneumonia. The reason that's very important is because the gold standard and the outcomes we train against are x-rays and blood tests in a high-end hospital. So we can be 85% accurate compared to a very, very expensive procedure in a facility that most children don't have access to. And this is just a short video that basically visualizes what the process looks like. So it starts with a questionnaire that most GPs would ask you, um, or the questions they would ask you when you go to um, their practice. There are a couple of observational things, like is the child um, lethargic? Do they have noisy breathing? Then there is a quick connection to the two devices. It's all wireless. Um, and then the examination experience basically consists of the healthcare worker placing, in this case, the digital stethoscope on these four locations at the front of the chest, holding the stethoscope for tw 20 seconds at each location uh, to capture the data and then moving on. We have a way of shortening the examination if the child's crying, because that's very frustrating for everyone involved. Um, so rather than nine measurements, they need to only capture five. And at the end of this, they also take a temperature reading with a conventional thermometer. So at that step, they submit all the data for analysis, uh, which is currently done on a cloud. Uh, we would look through all the questionnaire um, inputs, the device inputs, and then give them a recommendation of whether or not they need to take the child to, to a doctor, which in the Indian scenario is a hospital. Right, so getting to the part that everyone's going to be interested in. <laughs> that was a rather long introduction, but setting is very important. Uh, where does the AI fit in? So every one of these sensors that we use generate incredibly noisy signals. We only work with medically approved devices, so that does give us some level of standardization. Um, so you wouldn't work with a wellness wearable that doesn't have a, um, a certified output. Uh, but the challenge that, that, that this still presents is how do, you, how do you extract things that doctors are currently empirically trained um, to look out for? So to give you an example, uh, with the stethoscope, they look for about five different markers um, that they listen to. There isn't really a database of what these markers are. It's all on-the-job on the training. Um, so you take about... 10 to 15 years to become a very exceptional pulmonologist, and all of that is done through you being in a hospital, shadowing someone that's extremely experienced, um, and picking up that knowledge on the go. Um, so our challenge is to standardize that process, 
um, extract conventional things like vital signs, oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, heart rate, but also more advanced things like these lung sounds that I mentioned. And then once we've kind of populated this multitude of disease markers, our next challenge is how do we link those to a specific diagnosis of a condition? So sticking with my previous example, how do we diagnose pneumonia that typically requires an X-ray and a blood test in a highly trained pulmonologist with just the noisy signals that we can capture in a community setting? So just to dig a, a little bit deeper on that first part of translating noisy signals into um, evidence-based disease markers. Um, so this is the digital stethoscope. All of you have seen a stethoscope. There is absolutely nothing different other than this is digitized so that you can actually record the signal that it outputs. So in, a, in an ideal world, this is how it would function. You would have the signal captured in a clinical setting then you get a doctor to listen through it, look through it and tell you, here I hear wheezing and here I hear crackles. These are the different markers and the names that they've given them. And then you train your beautiful model to identify these markers um, in an automated way. Sounds wonderful. And if you dig a little bit deeper um, and get into, let's say, the libraries that you can find online for clinical training, they will show you crackles looks a little bit like this and wheezing looks a little bit like that and broken breathing a little bit different. So for all of you that do data science, you can see that there are quite a few patterns you can pick up and then hopefully um, detect it with your algorithm. Um, this holds incredible opportunities when it comes to improving access to specialist pulmonology, pulmonology ev um, evaluation. Um, the improvement of precision diagnosis, as well as um, enabling early detection for these conditions. And there's always a but. So the but is, when you do that in real life settings, you have very noisy environments and very, very noisy signals. You have the complexity of annotation and a terribly unreliable gold, gold standard. And I'll give you examples of all of those challenges. Um, so. Starting with the noisy signals, um, so our data is collected in Indian slums, plenty of background noise, often people chatting um, in the home about whatever they're going to cook for dinner. Uh, you have the community healthcare worker chatting to the parent, the community healthcare worker chatting to the child, trying to appease them because they're getting really impatient during the examination. So loads of talking. Loads of crying if the child is getting impatient, loads of background noise, um, and often poor contact because these are not ideally trained users or minimally trained users. Um, so the best they can do is hold the sensors in, in place, but they're not doctors. They haven't spent 15 years to appreciate how much pressure they need to um, exert and so on. Um, so one of the things we've done is develop an algorithm um, that, that classifies whether or not a signal is good enough for further interpretation. Um, the next thing we're doing is classifying noise so that we can give people very actionable output like, please don't talk during this recording uh, or you need to uh, calm down the child. Right, so talking about annotation and unreliable GOAT standards, we had seven experts from the UK and India annotate our data. Um, and we found absolutely terrible agreement in their annotation. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, Fly's Kappa, it basically gives you an indication of, um, of how good the, um, the kind of the correlation between different labels is. Um, in our data set, it was just about slight um, in between the seven pulmonology experts. Um, and there's some like shocking um, insights in here. If you have a look, in that first row, so crackles is the most indicative uh, lung sound of pneumonia. Across the users, annotating the exact same data set, some of them think that 0.4% of the data have crackles in them, others think that 10.6% of the data have crackles. So we're not even talking about slight differences, they just listen to and identify completely different things. So the way we addressed this was moving away from these very empirically developed gold standards and looking for more um, kind of holistic markers or acoustic markers 
of disease, so training against the overall outcome, which is the presence or absence of a condition like pneumonia, um, and then identifying differing, uh, different acoustic signatures that we can correlate directly with the outcome. Um, the very specific model we used was a DNN, DNN HMM. Um, if anyone's interested, we can have a very detailed discussion about this. Um, right, so this is all to do with identifying markers of disease. And the next challenge we have is, once we've identified them, how do we reach a final diagnosis? Um, and again, the opportunities are immense. Um, we can diagnose disease early. We can improve the precision of diagnosis. And most importantly, or at least the thing I'm most passionate about is prevent avoidable deaths, particularly in communities that otherwise don't get access to um, diagnosis. But again, that doesn't come without challenges. Um, so two major ones that we're tackling are data sparsity and model generalizability. So when it comes to data sparsity, there are many, many, many hospital data sets that you can get access to. And that's how I started my research in this space. Um, in academia, getting access to hospital data sets, developing models for diagnosis. They work beautifully, publishing, getting really excited about 97% accuracy. And then the, mon the moment you take these models to a community setting, you realize they don't generalize because nothing looks the same in a community. The data is very, very noisy. Patients look very different because it's potentially earlier on in the disease evolution. And also that the sensors you would use are not what a hospital uses normally. Um, so this here is a comparison between three data sets we've worked with across different geographies. Um, so the first one being a hospital data set in the Gambia, the second one a community data set with our sensors, and the third one a hospital data set from India. Um, as, it, as you can see, you can't even say that the, 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 the differences are driven by geography. Um, so even within the two Indian data sets, and these are all statistically powered data sets, by the way, I should have mentioned that. Um, the differences are just huge. Um, and just a, as a clarification, so what you're looking at, the spider plot is basically incidence of different symptoms for children with pneumonia. Um, so terribly variable. If you want to dig a little bit deeper and start, lo uh, start looking at patterns, so this is a um, TSNE plot um, of pneumonia cases across these different um, data sets. We're basically trying to cluster and use unsupervised learning to establish any patterns um, in the data in the different pneumonia cases. Um, you can see that there are stark differences between uh, certain groups that coincide with geogra geographical separation. Um, so if you look at the plot that says data set source, um, you can see that the blue dots kind of cluster on their own, uh, but then you have this giant cluster that basically has blue, gray, and brown. So all of them are pneumonia cases from different data sets. Why there are other pneumonia ca cases um, that just are complete outliers um, and don't have a mixture of, a mixture of um, um, kind of sources, there's absolutely no logic. Um, so we've started digging into um, the symptomatic distribution. So is it driven by, let's say, natural physiological differences be between populations? Some, um, for example, some populations like um, South, Indi uh, sorry, South Asian populations have naturally elevated heart rates. Is it driven by age groups? Um, there isn't really an answer to that other than the variability and then the underlying um, kind of comorbidities beh behind the disease um, are quite substantial. So the way we've, uh, we've kind of come up with a framework to overcome all of these challenges is to move away from trying to replicate what the clinical profession does at the moment and preserve their kind of overall evidence base in terms of outcomes, but use machine learning to generate better processes to reach those outcomes. So going back to the example I gave you with um, the digital stethoscope, rather than trying to replicate their labels of crackles, wheezing, grunting, and so on, what we're trying to do is identify patterns in the data that agree with their diagnosis of pneumonia based on um, x-rays and blood tests and so on. 
And you can generalize that across symptoms. You can generalize this across populations. Right. Um, just to give you a, an interesting rock curve, apologies for the way you want to be. That's meant for a different audience, not you. Um, everyone knows how a rock curve works probably here. Um, so just comparing our, uh, basically, performance against everything else that's out there as an option. Um, you have the orange dots, which are guidelines. Um, so these would be things that the World Health Organization and UNICEF have community healthcare workers using at the moment around the world. Very sensitive, but very unspecific. And then the blue and green dots are your doctors in this country, for example. Um, so we had seven different doctors annotate the data. And what you can see is exactly what you experience here. So you go to the doctor, they kind of say, well, it could be pneumonia, it could be just the cold. Why don't you go home and come back if it gets worse? So very, very specific, but terribly insensitive. Insensitive. Um, and what we are able to do with the approach that I describe is kind of bridge both worlds, have the sensitivity of these guidelines and the specificity of doctors. Right, the last thing I wanted to uh, mention are a few kind of opportunities, but also challenges around deploying this approach in low, low resource settings. Um, as I mentioned, the, the kind of the settings we work with, with at the moment are urban slums. Uh, this one in particular is in Mumbai. Um, and the opportunities this, ho this holds um, are huge, both in terms of data science and machine learning, so very exciting challenges. We're capturing data that doesn't exist off the shelf. Um, th that comes with a lot of excitement when it comes to developing models, diagnostic models. Um, but also, there's an opportunity to deliver primary healthcare um, in a setting that doesn't have an established primary care healthcare system at the moment. And the bottom line is powering universal healthcare coverage. Right, skipping to the challenges. Um, so, one of the bitter lessons we learned um, was never make assumptions before you've tested them very extensively. Um, so, even though originally we tested our technology um, kind of alongside the main streets of the slum and connectivity was reliable enough, the moment you try to cover the whole, that's the, the geography we cover, we realize there are many, many dark patches. So, what this picture shows you is um, a slum population in Mumbai, um, right next to the biggest dumping ground in Asia. Uh, that's divided in certain regions for planning reasons. Um, but this has 1.2 million people living in it. We're currently covering it with about 10 healthcare workers that need to move around, test different children, and then take them to the doctor if they need to. If you have patchy connectivity, at the end of that screen where I showed you a recommendation, you can't get anything because the models at the moment live on the server. Um, so what that's triggered is a whole <laughs> new exercise of figuring out how we deploy models on device, uh, particularly models that were developed to be quite computationally intensive. Um, so really eager to talk to anyone that has expertise on that front and can share knowledge. Um, and the second challenge is we work with very minimally um, trained users. Um, so what that means is you can end up with a lot of uh, bad data and not actionable data. Um, so one of the big engineering exercises that, that we are going through is providing very actionable feedback so that you can straight away know whether all the measurements that have been captured are good enough for a diagnosis. Um, just a very short note, so I'll, throughout this talk, I mainly talk about, talked about um, child health. We're doing the exact same thing for elderly people in this country. Um, so if anyone's interested in that space, I'm happy to have a lot of conversations. Slightly different challenges because we're looking at longitudinal monitoring. So rather than diagnosis based on an examination, is monitoring someone over time and then identifying complications for chronic conditions. Um, yeah, I can't talk about India and not finish with a Gandhi quote. <laughs> so be the change you want to see in the world. Um, that's what we believe um, as a company, and if that's something that you're interested in and aspire to do with your work, I'll be very delighted to talk to you. Thank you very much.
been told that we can have questions and answers. Is that true? Yeah. 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 yeah right. There are some microphones, apparently. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, in case somebody wants to, to help you, is there like any public data or open source libraries where you can contribute? Uh, public data that we open source or yeah, like generally? Just, that you use and somebody can like create, like try to create a better model or just contribute to a package like in terms of? Um, so at this stage, we don't open source our data. Having said that, we are very interested in collaborations. So if anyone's interested to work with us, that could be, we are hiring, so that could be the more permanent way, uh, but also in terms of advisors um, and consultants, any, any format is possible. So if, if someone is actively interested in this space, more than happy to, uh, to discuss that. Hi, thanks for your talk. That's is really inspiring. Um, I'm just curious. So, are you collecting all the data that you get from all the sensors and sending it to the cloud, or are you discarding some of the data, lo like on, on whatever device? Yeah, great question. Uh, you should have asked me that question months ago, because <laughs> originally we were sending all the data to device, then realized that's a terribly stupid idea. Um, so, at the moment, storing it on, on device before we send it to the server. How do you deal with seasonality of disease? Because you, can't, you might have a population that is in some area that some disease might be an output of some disease. The signals might mean something else. You know, doctors normally say they say 50% chance of this, 45% this. So it depends on context and time of year, uh, whatever. Sorry, how do you deal with what was the first I mean, thing so you said? You're, you're measuring certain symptoms, but these yeah. things might mean something else in depending on the time of the year or or there is some, some disease that's currently prevalent. So they're not, they're, you can't do one-to-one -one mapping between parameters to a disease. It might mean something else, depending right. where you yeah. are. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, so there are a couple of things that feed into that. One is the seasonality, definitely a huge issue. That's why we run larger trials that span across 12 months, because um, you, you get a lot of seasonality. Um, the other part of this is the gold standard outcome is absolutely crucial. Um, so that's why we need to run control trials and we have clinicians setting the final diagnosis that we train against. Because whilst you can have a lot of diagnostic overlap, at the end of the day, there should be a right or wrong diagnosis that a clinician can reach in a hospital. Um, so we work in partnership with um, hospitals to basically annotate that data in real time. I think there's one at the front. Oh, sorry. Hi, this is amazing, by the way. Thank you very uh, much. Honestly. Um, I'm curious, because you chose the cloud, um, if you encountered any blockers, be it from government or some kind of laws, because it's data about um, patients. And how did you? How did you, um, I don't know, solve it? Mm -hmm. Because it's data about, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, patients, people. Patients. Generally, yeah. I mean, yeah. and a lot of corporations, when it comes to um, clients or especially health data, it's a no-no for going to the cloud. So I'm very curious. Yeah, if. yeah. Um, so we, did, we haven't encountered pushback, but that's because we accept that we need to move more slowly than a conventional startup in terms of getting the ethicals approvals in place um, and really ensuring that everything's done in a, in a kind of a secure and compliant way. Um, so in the case of India, it, it takes six months to get an ethical approval and you need to be very kind of evidence-based in terms of where you store the data, what you do with it. Um, the other aspect to that is um, we are going through C certification uh, to be a medical device. So again, a slow process, but one that, that's worth doing if you actually want to have something actionable that people um, can take into their medical practice. Uh, but you, you, know, you could look at them as blockers or you could look at them as opportunity to do things right. Um, it, it, yeah, it's a tedious process, but one that's worth doing.
Hey, um, I was just wondering if, you, if you've thought of doing any kind of generative modeling in this space? I mean, like, you know, looking at what kind of spectrograms you would expect your model to be, to give you, you know, the most, uh, the highest score to, for example. I mean, and maybe you could produce like a new gold standard, because this is the thing that's most likely to correlate with, with the output. Yeah, yeah, brilliant question. Um, we are doing some of this, particularly around the acoustic analysis. Um, so if you take something, what should be incredibly conventional, like respiratory rate, like everyone's heard of respiratory rate, all doctors use it. There is no gold standard for this. There are two at the moment, and both of them are flawed. One is watching the child's chest and counting. The other one is listening to your stethoscope and counting. And if you ask different doctors to do that exercise, you get very different answers. Um, so there's definitely, definitely an element of that we're doing. The challenge is you kind of need to do a bit of both because you can't just leapfrog and tell the clinical profession this approach of doing things is totally wrong. Um, so you need to figure out how you replicate what they're doing, but then also give them a comparison of, hey, we could, do, we could be doing this in a much better way. Um, so in our case, it's just yeah, a balancing act of demonstrating both in an evidence-based way. Thank you very much. Yeah, great talk. Um, in your uh, your video, you it, <clears throat> it did the, the the test, and then it just came up with a recommendation to take it to a hospital. Uh, does it provide any sort of explainability or uh, information to the doctor once they've got to the hospital, or do they have to repeat the tests again all over again themselves? Yeah, thanks a lot for that question. I kind of whizzed through it because I wasn't sure how much context people want to hear. Yes, um, so the other thing we have is a web portal uh, that's meant for patient management. So when the child reaches the doctor, the doctor can pull up that case and see what the child looked like in the community. That's a way for us to capture the gold standard annotation as well as provide function, extra function for the doctor um, to be able to make more evidence-based decisions. Otherwise, he just sees the child there for three minutes and has to reach a diagnosis somehow. There is one more. And do you detect any heart problems? So it's like there is a arrhythmia or anything like this? Yeah, great question. Um, so at the moment, we're focused on respiratory conditions, and that kind of goes back to the previous question because of regulation. Um, so our goal is to get certified as a medical device for respiratory conditions. We, we do capture data that also contains some um, valuable information for heart, heart sounds and then heart conditions, but um, it would be just a lot to do to try and get certified uh, for two very different spaces at the same time. Great. Thank you very much.